to the audience in a minute, but I just want to give both John McGrillan and uh, Owen a, a chance to say something. Uh, John, the, the impact of Brexit on Northern Ireland and perhaps <coughs> the impact of an increasing perception in Britain of Northern Ireland once again as a problem. Well, I mean, I think, I think the impacts in Northern Ireland are slightly different to those here. You know, there's some commonality in terms of the issues, but I suppose one looks at the exchange rate issue. In many ways, that works to Northern Ireland's advantage. So, you know, since the Brexit referendum, uh, visitor numbers, short break visitor numbers in the Republic of Ireland have gone up by 83%. The numbers of people at, in Northern Ireland who are taking breaks at home have increased by 22%. So those numbers, which no so there are, have probably changed slightly as a result of that. I think one of the biggest challenges facing us, and it was one that Owen picked up on earlier in terms of the availability of labour, and I think that issue becomes even greater for us because that drop in uh, exchange rate means that the money that you know the Polish person or Lithuanian or Latvian was maybe sending home was worth 20% less, and therefore you know why would you stay? There's also the uncertainty around their future within Northern Ireland, and we've seen a flight of migrant labour, and you know, we've got. Uh, almost full employment in Northern Ireland and people like Howard Hastings sitting here opening new hotels, finding it extremely difficult to find labour you know, to do that work and you know, where Owen saw that as perhaps a, an advantage potentially of Brexit happening here, that's a significant disadvantage for us. To your point then, um, yeah, my, my, I mean, I suppose my concern about all of this is that this is being you know, perceived as the Irish problem or the Northern Irish problem or the Irish border problem and therefore we are causing the UK all sorts of issues as it seeks to, to leave the, the European Union. And, you know, I, I don't, I mean, it's a softer issue, but, you know, there are challenges I think that we have, and I think some of the narrative around Leo Varadkar and how he is being perceived and the role that he's playing, I don't think works very well for us in terms of how Northern Ireland or indeed the Republic of Ireland might be perceived in the, the mind of, of the, you know, the British public, uh, which you know longer term could have an impact that is not absolutely evident. But you know, we some sentiment analysis that we've done in terms of focus groups in the UK would suggest that that is a factor that's now starting to come through. Yeah, it is. I'm friends who are Remainers who were on the phone to me the morning after the vote in tears over what had happened, and I've just noticed over the last few months increasingly they say your prime minister is making this very difficult. And I'm saying, well, of course, he's the Irish Prime Minister, you know. But anyway, that's Owen, his job. Yeah. That's his job. What do you see coming down the road with Brexit? I think um, there's one word that was first used by somebody in this room, you, this room uh, Brexit unity. We have spent too long in this industry, very dependent on one market. We didn't uh, reduce that dependence during the... Uh, boom. We didn't reduce it during the recession when we lost uh, a million British visitors almost overnight and go and start playing in other playgrounds. Uh, our market share in the United States is respectable. Our market share in Britain was about 4%. But if we had 4% market share in Germany, uh, which if we built that up during the boom, we wouldn't be looking at this problem. Less than 1% of a market share out of the second biggest outbound uh, tourism market of the world is pitiful. We didn't build it. We are now, uh, whatever happens, it's I mean, better, I mean it, it's improving. But it's it, improved. I mean, we're dealing with maybe 800,000, you know, we're dealing with 4 million coming from Britain. We have access. Okay, look at the countries that are really in problems, have problems this morning. Cyprus has been name checked. Uh, they've reeling from the collapse of their quasi-national carrier, having lost their co national carrier two years ago. Similar inbound figures to Ireland. Iceland, the fastest growth probably this side of the equator, looking at big consolidation in their airline industry. We are two, hour, we're two hours away from uh, two, uh, counting Britain, uh, three of the top five outbound markets in the world, and we're five hour, seven hours, maybe five hours with a good tailwind, away from the, the second biggest outbound market, the third biggest outbound market in the world since China's ahead. But we are in this position where we can build our tourism, look at what we're losing and replace it. Um, what the dependence on tourism 
bears a very close resemblance to how the Irish economy operated back when we joined the European Union. I think you were the star reporter, the Carlo Nationalist at the time. Indeed but, I was. <laughs> but um, we were probably 60, 65% of our exports uh, to Britain. Now Britain pulling out, it starts her biggest export market. It's still significant, but not dominant. And in tourism, because we took easy options, we allowed it to become dominant. Now, it's not the fault of people in this room. The gatekeepers, largely the biggest gatekeeper in the country, uh, the man with the, the harp on his tail who lives in Mullingar, he was the, built up a lot of his business on UK Ireland. Ireland. Yeah. And he is now looking elsewhere because the aviation question is the big, uh, it's the um, Airbus A380 in the room. Uh, that uh, Theresa May hasn't objected, it hasn't shown up in any of the, uh, hasn't raised, hasn't shown up in any of the major documents. And just to give a, the um, Ladybird introduction to what uh, the aviation, uh, I don't have the answer, but the theories of what's going to happen, uh, articulated very forcefully by two Irishmen, Michael O'Leary says, uh, Air France and Lufthansa have such a small market share in Britain that it suits them to push the agenda of punishing the ordinary British voter by depriving them of their cheap flights to Spain. They have the ear of two very powerful players. Willie Walsh has the opposite approach. He's uh, CEO of IAG, and he says that there, he said, since Bermuda, Bermuda too would have uh, been replaced by the EU Open Skies Agreement, 250 separate agreements have been signed up by the European Union with, uh, for air access. He says, that it's, that it's going to be a box ticking exercise to replace all of those on March the 29th. But in the absence of any agreement, people, uh, Michael O'Leary will, will, t will say flights are coming to a halt and he's known for being controversial. But Michael McGrail, who is the chair of the Irish Aviation Authority, is not someone who goes around talking about charging for the lose. He told the Oireachtas Committee that's exactly what's going to happen unless we have an agreement. So while the aviators are looking at that sort of scenario, they're going to be looking at other options. That is the Brexit opportunity. Irish tourism could suddenly find themselves, instead of having this big British market dropped from them, the gatekeepers um, offering new opportunities and anything that moves our horrendous dependence on the British market away, it's a burdensome for our industry when something happens like the break, outbreak of the troubles in 68 or foot and mouth, that burden could be removed by Brexit. Short-term pain, long-term gain. So we should stop whinging? I think there's a lot of uh, whinging going on in the loudest, noisiest industries and the agri-food industry, is, you know, which is 41% dependent. It's not ideal, it's something that was not our decision, but now it's happened. Deal with it like everybody who has, a, 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 has to have a sudden shock through the industry. De, de, uh, the, a, a, an example, a tourism example, would be when Turkey shot down a, a Russian aircraft and suddenly 28% 20 of their inbound market was turned off like a tap. Would you deal with it creatively? You deal with it resourcefully. The tourism industry in Ireland, back to the days of Brendan O'Regan and all those great innovators, has a history of creative and resourceful responses. And it's not like we're, we're in a position where we're not capable of dealing with it. We have three of the most powerful outbound, big spending markets in the world within easy reach. And as we'll hear from James later on, we'll be, we'll, we have um, direct flights to China and 41% growth out of the market that everybody's watching as the saviour of international tourism. Our, uh, Paul's figures were very impressive early on, 6 7%, but that's only in line with the global average. We should, be, we should do our utmost to stay in line with that global uh, average, and that means replacing those, Brexit visitor, those British visitors. Okay, so no direct benefits from Brexit, but lots of opportunities. It's some direct benefits. Yeah. Um, one of the direct benefits is that it's quite interesting that the other... Um, Big European markets, uh, no light in my some of them. Uh, Spain is down this year out of Britain. Um, the currency shock is actually affecting all of that European, and we have got, uh, you know, while we are still, we are going to be part of Europe, we're sharing that shock of, the, and the British visitor has got um, a, a huge amount of access to it. People, 
tend to think of London and what you do. If you're in Leeds Bradford, if you're in Newcastle, if you're in Durham, if you're in Newquay and Cornwall, your access routes out for holidays aren't, uh, aren't enormous. We are, have a huge ferry capacity uh, across to, to Britain. So we are in a position, even in a shrinking British outbound market, where they're looking at raised prices right across Europe as well, we are in a position to still compete still in the, uh, in the regions and in the seasons especially because a lot of what would happen in Leitrim Longford would be coach tours from Britain uh, out of season because they don't have a hell of a lot of money to spend but this is a, 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 an English speaking friendly place where they can have a few drinks and have a few songs roll out the barrel or whatever uh, and all of that is there for them and it will continue to be there for them at a slightly larger uh, and, more price. and a very big Irish diaspora a very big Irish diaspora okay. Now, have we any questions? Because I know this must affect practically everybody in the audience who is involved in the tourism industry. Any questions for our panel on Brexit or any aspect of Brexit? Yeah, can we get a, 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 a microphone here? Would you mind keeping your hand up just so the, the microphone we get to you? Uh, Owen Travers from the uh, AIB advisory site. Uh, it's a question for John around um, supply chains and whether the Northern Ireland market is effectively getting its goods from within the Northern Ireland market. So we're talking about linen, uh, staff you've already addressed, but are there other aspects such as meat, dairy, that are coming across the border into the Northern Irish tourist market? Because certainly uh, in the border counties on, on the Irish side, um, there would be you know, linen being done across the border, meat being sourced across the border. Have you a sense as to where the Northern Irish market sits on that? John? Um, I, mean, I haven't looked at that specifically for the tourism industry, but you know, certainly the interdependency between you know, the economy of Northern Ireland and the Republic, particularly when you look at you know, the, the agri-food sector or you know, the service sector, they are deeply interdependent and certainly <coughs> If we speak to our colleagues in the agri-food sector, you know, they are deeply concerned about the potential impact of all of this. Um, now clearly, a lot of that, the food is sourced at home, but certainly a lot of it would, you know, would, would come across the border. And, and vice versa, it moves the other way. Uh, so you know, I think people are deeply concerned about the routine Brexit, the implications that will have right across the piece. Yeah, and there's, I mean, I think it was you last night, uh, Noel, were describing uh, a time where um, you were sent down or somebody was sent down to look at the cars queuing to go into Northern Ireland and finding that many of the hire cars, seeing the difficulty and the fact that they'd have to wait uh, and the nuisance around. of it, simply turning around and coming away. People don't like yeah. borders. And, and Olivia, the Irish Ferry's new giant ferry would be incapable of being turned around uh, in the time that they need to if we had the heavy customs checks and border checks. So there are implicated for yeah. all of that. I think it's yeah. interesting, the ferry industry as well, um, Anne Rothwell has invested in you know, two new vessels, um, sailing, or stand up to new vessels coming on stream, intended for direct Ireland Europe routes. Yes, yes. So the land bridge, yeah. almost irrespective of whatever happens, can be very probably possible. be less important yeah. in the future. I remember when I saw the picture of that big ship I thought, holy God, yeah, that's what, that's what Brexit means. Mm. It, was, it was quite a symbol. Anybody else want to put a question? Yeah, would you mind keeping your hand up so we can get a microphone up to you? Thank you, Olivia, uh, at the panel. Uh, my name's Phil Brown from Limerick Institute of Technology. Um, uh, I have a question uh, from your presentation, though. You spoke, you spoke about the common travel area. Mm -hmm. between Britain, Ireland and the Isle of Man. And I wonder, like, why would that be affected by Brexit if there was an ordeal? Because that predated um, the EU to yeah. Ireland. Right, I think I said that we expect that to continue um, because it does predate the EU or both our memberships of the EU. Um, and also, it's a far broader than just the travel because we're entitled to be able to work in Britain and vice versa. Um, so we don't expect that to change. Um, but there has been some publicity about it, or some people writing about it, that it may be effective. But in my view, it won't be. Okay, okay. I, mean, I, think, I think the challenge there is around those people who are non-Irish or non-UK yeah. residents and their ability to, to move across the border. So a Polish guy living in Dundalk, would he have the right to work 
you know, in, in a hotel in Uri, for example, yes. you know, those are the sorts of things yeah. which are not allowed. Uh, and in yeah. visitor yeah. terms, uh, the people James is bringing in from China and from Muzal is bringing in from India, um, the cobbling together of this common visa was, it was a very, very significant for Irish tourism, so not having to apply for two visas. Uh, there are certainly questions over the viability of that. And interesting, to go back to my Brexit unity, um, should that uh, common travel area, should we be on it unravel, we will, it would be time to start looking, especially if the Northern Ireland uh, sea border becomes uh, comes into place for, for people movement. And uh, people forget, by the way, this, for the first 30 years of Northern Ireland, you did need uh, a pass to go from Northern Ireland up to 1953. You know, it is something that was historically there, even when Northern Ireland was part of the UK. But one of the options- Northern that, Ireland is part of the UK. Uh, yes, from 1922. Uh, to 1953, you still needed documentation right. to cross. It's a, it's a historical anomaly that has been forgotten in the current debate. But we will have the opportunity of Schengen. The Schengen debate will come up. If we uh, were a member of Schengen, and our Taoiseach would be, uh, has said privately, it'd be amenable to you know, joining Schengen, Schengen would change the game for the big two emerging markets, the big four or five emerging markets, including uh, what uh, James would be talking about the afternoon. Um, and that would re o un overcome all the, the temporary disadvantages of losing the common visa area, which applies to about 22 countries. I think to your point that one, one of the fears was that people can move freely, as John said, non-residents of Britain or non-residents of Ireland could be used as a backdoor for immigration into the UK. And since that was one of the prime, I suppose, levers or buttons on which people voted to leave, um, that will come under scrutiny. But I don't think it's going to happen. Okay. Oh, you want to just, just a quick one, Olivia. And it's, it's no one of Noel's last points about the, the sort of Brexit supports for industry. And, and, and Owen, Owen, number two there, mentioned about you know market diversification and getting on with it and growing uh, our share of the German market or the US market or whatever. But if you're a small tourism business, uh, say a small tourist attraction or a small accommodation provider, and you have a heavy dependency on the British market, it's quite intimidating to have to go into, say, the German market or the US market and try and drum up business. You know, it's very costly. And remember, a lot of these SMEs have very small margins and very finite marketing budgets. So it seems to me very sensible and strategic for a financial aid package to, to be offered to tourism SMEs to help them, if you like, market diversify away from Britain. So for example, if you wanted to go to the States to a trade show, there should be a grant you should be able to avail of so that your flight costs and your registration and your hotel accommodation and so on is at least partly covered. And, and Noel made a very good point that the food industry has this already, or be a handout grants. Enterprise Ireland have a 5,000 euro grant cash grant for any business that is looking uh, for support and help to diversify, diversify away from Britain. And tourism doesn't have that at all at the moment. And the one good thing about the VAT rate increase in the budget was that tourism got a, a, a few extra pennies in the budget. So there's about 35 million euro extra in the tourism agency kitty yeah. for 2019. And it would be great, I think, for the tourism industry if some of that could come back in terms of a financial aid package to allow businesses to mitigate against Brexit. Tourism looking for grants to diversify markets. Owen, what do you think of that? Um, marketing do, um, is all very well. It creates the appetite for it. But the real, what really drives tourism in Ireland and in the world is access and beds. And if we have our beds in place and we have our access in place, um, you know, it, if you don't have them in place, no matter what marketing you do, uh, there is... You know, uh, there's an unquantifiable thing of putting that image in people's heads, which Fulcher Ireland achieved with the Wild Atlantic Way, uh, uh, and that creates the appetite. But when people s start Googling, it's the fare that decide and the number of stops they have on the way. And we've made great progress in access, and we, it's left us in a better position to cope with Brexit than would otherwise be the case. And that's where our energy should be put. 
But you were talking earlier about the fact that we had the opportunity to work much harder at diversification, and we didn't. So we, we, we took the easy route. Yeah. So was that when state aid should have been put in to diversification? Certainly, um, the, the big marketing strategy, Tourism Ireland's budget has been just reduced, reduced, reduced. Even at boom times, there, you know, there wasn't that... Um, it, the, the vision was probably there, but it wasn't being translated into marketing spend. Okay. Olivia? There was... Uh, yes, Margaret, and somebody after you then to come in above. Yeah. Um, I'm, it's not a question for the panel, but I thought a, a view from a hotelier uh, would be interesting. And we have Howard Hastings here, probably the person who's the last yeah. person to open a, a new hotel on this island. And yeah. it might be interesting to hear from uh, Howard whether or not he's looking at new markets or where he's going to fill all those hotels okay. in Northern Ireland. Okay, are you going to give him your mic? Yep. Thanks, Margaret. Howard. Thank you very much. Um, I, I suppose at the very early stages of the Brexit debate, I, I was struck by the economist who said that uh, no matter what the outcome of the vote, business will get over it, business always will. And so whilst we talk in slightly apocalyptic terms, about what some of the outcomes might be. I don't doubt the resilience of the tourism economy north and south to do what they have to do to find new markets. It's still desperately unclear as to what the outworkings of the Brexit vote will be. That's the first time I've heard about things like linen supplies and yes, all our bed linens are laundered in the south. Is that a, an issue coming for us or not? Stuffs and other things. Um, I, I, I'm again a bit alarmed about the sense that Ireland might join the, the Schengen area and leave the, the rest of the United Kingdom on a solo run. That would, uh, I think, really fundamentally undermine Tourism Ireland's ability to market the island of Ireland as a whole, which is, I think, one of the things that really has uh, helped North and South. Uh, in terms of the overall promotion of the island ha has been a, r a real uh, kickstart to tourism over the last 20 years. Tourism are now in the point, of, the point of celebrating 20 years of existence. Uh, I'd like to think that politicians in the South would see that as a, as a, 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 la a, as a very retrograde step in, in terms of cooperation, uh, either North and South or East and West in a post-Brexit scenario. Howard, did that vote break your heart? Because I think it broke mine and an awful lot of other people, that, that Brexit vote. I was uh, staggered at some of the people who voted to leave, uh, and uh, especially, um, and, and it's become a, a sort of uh, a, an act of faith amongst the, the, the DUP that they were all Brexiteers, but they weren't at the time. Uh, and I think two things drove their, 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 their Brexiteer mentality. One was, they've been paid a lot of money to place an ad uh, in national papers. And the other thing, that were local elections going on at the time, and, and, and the, the kind of um, the TUB leader, Jim Allister, was a, an ardent Brexiteer, and, and in certain constituencies, they thought they might leak votes to his party if they were seen as Remainers. So I don't think it was a, a big strategic play by the DUP at the time, but has now become a, a complete act of faith on their part to kind of see this project through. Um, it is, um, I, I think, uh, uh, the, the lack of government at the moment means uh, that we can't conduct the debate as to how much the strength of opinion was within Northern Ireland to remain, uh, and uh, particularly amongst younger people. And those figures that show the extent to which the market, and maybe motels like yours, depend on overseas and Republic of Ireland visitors coming across the border. I mean, have you fears that that, that could slow or stop? We, and it's a two, you can see how very much Northern Ireland uh, has for overseas vis visitors Dublin Airport as its primary port of access. Uh, you know, we're delighted with the growth of Dublin Airport because it facilitates that process, that's great. Um, uh, I think we also, from a Northern Ireland um, island of Ireland point of view, uh, seek to attract more of the two and a half million people in the south who've never overnighted in the north. Uh, and again, just that sort of uh, mental and emotional 
to conversation <coughs> around the border uh, would make that a more difficult job for, for John, for me, and for everyone in the Northern Ireland tourism industry. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the yeah. sort of memory. People sometimes being afraid and not quite being sure what they're afraid of. Anymore. I think a political debate has exacerbated that, you know, the sort of jibing back and forth about, you know, yeah. the certain yeah. comments about certain politicians. So it, for me, it starts to create this impression of Northern Ireland is not quite welcome for those people from the South, you know, because that is part of the narrative. And yeah. that has been our big challenge to try and overcome that and change that sort of perceptions that people have. Yeah. And, and we were moving in the right, right direction, and my fear is that that will start to, again, once again, become part of the narrative that, that makes the job that we do that much more difficult. And you would have thought that lesson had been learned. I remember, you know, the, the, the megaphone diplomacy across the Irish Sea between Ted Heath and Jack Lynch back then. I'm one of the few people who remembers Jack Lynch. Yeah. But <coughs> we thought we'd learned that lesson because certainly Heath and Lynch yeah. learned it and very quickly started to have meetings well, where they decided um, we'd talk in yeah. private rather than, you know, megaphones across the Irish Sea. Just, and here we are again. But if we look back a couple of years ago when Arlene Foster was the Minister for Tourism, and Leo Bradker was the Minister of Tourism down here. Right. They had a fantastic relationship. They did. They you did. Know, and everybody is working really well together, you know, and that, that the sort of Brexit has now started to fracture those relationships. And Brexit and the, and the vacuum. Yes. Yeah, of the, of the, the executive. There's a man been waiting patiently at the very back who wanted to come in if we could just get a microphone to him. And is there anybody else who would like to make a comment while we're at it? I'm five minutes, uh, Councillor Jim Gildee from the Blue and Down County Council. And I'd just like to ask the panel if they think that the that Brexit is going to have a bigger uh, impact on tourism in the Greater Dublin area than in, for example, where we are today. And if so, is there anything we can do in the short term to mitigate against that uh, shock? How is Dunleary Noel going to be affected by Brexit? The Royal Borough. <laughs> <laughs> I live there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't live there. Um, there's no doubt, I mean, the short break, the, the, the city break to Dublin or the greater Dublin area is an important component um, of the industry demand for Dublin and surroundings. Um, and that, that's a bit vulnerable at the moment because of the currency thing. Um, it's really value, it's really whatever proposition you can put into that marketplace. But I thought it was interesting, and Tim can correct me if I'm wrong, but from memory, there was a survey last year, I think, about um, the impact of Brexit on hotel demand and so forth. And probably the people that were least worried, uh, relatively speaking, were the Dublin hotels, because they were satisfied that they could get an alternative source of business. So it wasn't going to leave a hole you know, in, in, in their demand profile. Um, and that, that's probably true. Um, now, obviously, it was exacerbated by the fact that there was a shortage of supply in Dublin. So it was relatively easy to fill that space if the Brits pull it out. Um, but I think it's the proposition you put into the marketplace. Um, as Owen said, you know, there's plenty of access um, from 24 different airports in, in Britain, um, maybe to focus on a particular catchment area, and um, maybe to not, not just say, you know, we're going into the British market. Um, I, I think that in marketing terms, cities are critically important. Um, so if, if you know, you target Leeds, Bradford, or you target Edinburgh, or you target Manchester, or whatever. So more focused, I would say, marketing, rather than just putting it out there saying, come to Dunleary, or come to Greater Dublin area, and have it in national press or something. I think it's to focus on, on where you've got good air links, and good sea access. You can drive from Manchester to Hollyhead in two hours or less. Um, that's, I think, what needs to be done. And Dunleary has a real story to tell in terms of British-Irish yes, relations. relations. I mean, yeah. they, you know, the numbers of people from the British forces, as you would well know, um, who, who lived there, retirees from parts of the empire who came and lived there. I mean, there's a reason why it was called the Royal Borough. So it would have struck me that, in terms of the immediate British market, with all the links there and everything, um, it, it, it should have its own own story to tell. It could do with a few more hotels though, couldn't it? There are very few hotels in Dunleary, which always surprises me. Have we any more uh, comments from the floor? We're coming towards the end. I don't see any hands up. So I'll just go to you, Owen, on this question. And I think it's something Noel uh, raised, uh, a very uh, interesting point. The lack, 
of competitiveness. If we down here are ruled by EU requirements, say, as you pointed out, for drivers and the length of time they can work in any day, mm -hmm. and we end up with Northern Ireland drivers being able to operate more competitively down here because they are not ruled by, by that, are there a number of competitiveness issues that are going to they're, arise for us? They're already there, Olivia. There are issues with uh, tour guides, there was somebody from the tour guides earlier on picking up at Belfast airports their uh, Department of Environment, Northern Ireland, nothing to do with tourism, regulations on the use of vehicles and picking them up and acting as a tour guide if you're based in the 26 counties, whereas the six counties, those based in the six counties can operate out of Dublin airport. They're, they're all, like, they're, they're 15 or 20, maybe lots of little regulatory uh, in, uh, di differences that are, are, arise as annoyances that stop small business operators uh, stand in their way, bureaucratic requirements. The nose point is these could possibly increase and it's quite likely they'd increase rather than diminish. Uh, the way forward is to have some sort of integration uh, under tourism to Ireland and the existing arrangements that we can continue after Brexit. You know, in some ways, um, yeah. those could be a disadvantage for us, you know, rather than an advantage, because you know, you've got this issue where you know, a seven-seater vehicle, nine-seater vehicle turns off, drops people off in Belfast you know, to go for dinner, go to the Titanic Centre, play golf, whatever. Legally, they can't pick them up again and take right. them back. So, you know, you've got people then being trailed through the courts because they're operating as a taxi without a taxi licence. And as a result of there, that, then people say, well, you know what, I'll, I'll not bother. There are half a dozen Irish tour guides uh, due court appearances under this. Oh, okay. yeah, for that so that's, reason. Uh, that's just yeah. one instance of it, all yeah. of them. A last point to you, John. The political vacuum in Northern Ireland, which means that there is not a, a, a unified voice speaking on behalf of Northern Ireland. How big a weakness is that from your point of view? I suppose generally, you know, certainly in the Brexit debate is, is hard. So there's no one there speaking and making the point that the majority of people in Northern Ireland voted through Ruin. Um, and industry has tried to get its voice heard and has had to do that through the CBI in the UK. So there's no counterbalance to the, you know, the what's happening between the, the relationship between the DUP and, and the Conservatives. Um, I mean, the one thing I would say is Northern Ireland is, and Northern Ireland people, and Northern Ireland businesses are extremely resilient. You know, with mm. 30 years of uh, 40 years of balance, yeah. much worse than what we're dealing with today, yeah. and have survived and, and have flourished. And my sense is that most people are sort of of a view that, yeah, we really need to get ourselves sorted out. But you know what? In the meantime, we we'll just done and we'll do what needs to get done because no one's going to do it for us. Okay, and on that note, John, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to Noel. Thanks to Owen. We want you all back here, and by the way,